Hey guys, we're gonna get into uh, some notions of revisionist history today. Obviously, one of the big problems that we are seeing in curriculum, that we're seeing in education, that we're hearing from different personalities, whether it be in the media, whether it be a Hollywood or uh, some kind of athlete, we're hearing a lot of narratives that have come from a very revisionist place in American history, where there is a major changing and, and retelling of a story in a negative fashion, apart from what is actually true history. And actually, we'll get into probably Woodrow Wilson a little bit later, where, where some of this progressive revisionism really took root in America and really changed fundamentally the dynamic of the nation. But if you back up, one of the very interesting things to study in American history is part of the abolition movement in America. And, and a lot of times, the way the story is told today is it wasn't until really like the 1820s or 30s that anybody was an abolitionist in America. In fact, the Smithsonian Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., that's kind of one of the things they communicate is really it wasn't until the 1820s or 30s that any white people fought to defend the rights of any black people, which is just so historically ridiculous. However, it's interesting to back up and see people that were part of the abolition movement and, and even the, the progression and change they had along their own journey, their view of America, how it evolved over time is, as they were part of the process. One of those guys is Frederick Douglass, someone whose name should be very well known. And even though many people have heard the name Frederick Douglass, a lot of people don't know much of his story. Yeah, absolutely. And we have many artifacts from Douglass that helps us tell and communicate that story. This is actually a fun one just to show you his signature. That's his signature right there, Frederick Douglass. This is actually in 1882, so towards the end of his life. But this right here is an early edition of his first autobiography. It was originally written in 1845. This is an 1849 imprint of it. You can see his picture right there. And there is the information page. But in this, this is shortly after Douglas has escaped from slavery. He grew up a slave, I mean, really under terrible conditions, oppressed. Um, I mean, horrible. If you haven't ever read his autobiography, I highly encourage you to do so. You can find it online for free on Google Books, places like that. But well, his life is, is really bad until he's able to escape. And, and let's clarify. So you mentioned read his autobiography. Uh, it's worth noting, this <laughs> is exactly a, right. it's a collection of the autobiographies because there were three autobiographies, and we'll get into more of that in a second, yeah. because this is where it's interesting to see someone's evolution over their life, which this is something very fair that as, as we study history in general, one of the things that we will talk about is that a lot of times people will cherry pick a moment from someone's life, and specifically, we see this a lot with the Founding Fathers if it comes to the issue of religion or Christianity, where someone might take something from Founding Father who is seemingly saying something very negative about Christianity or about the Bible or some doctrine of biblical Christianity. And, and what we would point out is that you need to look at more of the entirety of their life to really get a better perspective of it. Is that what they really believed their whole life? Or is this just some weird moment in their life? Let, let's study a little bit more about them. And one of the great examples of that is Frederick Douglass, because he wrote three different autobiographies nobody knows how long they're going to live, right? And especially in earlier America when life is a little more fragile and dangerous yeah, on a lot of levels. kind of precarious, kind of precarious. You don't know how long you're going to live. So the, this first autobiography that, that Jonathan mentioned, this is an 1849 reprint. It, it came out in 1845, was the original. But Douglas is telling his story about what it was like being a slave and, and then becoming a free man and living in America at that time when there's still a lot of heightened tensions, a lot of racial problems in America at that time. And this is a of course, the tensions leading up and building to the Civil War. But then he wrote a second autobiography in 1855. He, his last autobiography was, I think, 1889, it's right? Towards the ends of his life. But it's after the Civil War, after he's lived an entire full life, he goes back and, and takes another crack at it. And, and this is what's interesting. If, if you study, because one of the things that, that sometimes people do is they'll read his first autobiography and go, well, here's what Douglas actually thought about America. And it's like, well... No, that's what he thought about America at that time up to that place because, again, 1845, there's still a lot of racial tensions and issues in America. And actually, he was part of an abolition movement. And one of the leaders of the abolition movement, actually a white guy, was talking about how the Constitution was racist because it allowed slavery. And Douglas bought into this notion of saying, man, America's really racist. The Constitution is racist. The Constitution allows slavery. And then someone challenged him. Have you ever read the Constitution? Because I, I don't think it's racist. And Douglas, like this epiphany moment, Douglas like, fine, I'm going to read it. And he reads it, 
only to discover that it's not in fact racist. Yeah, and he even goes through in a, a longer process than that of reading other scholars, constitutional people, people outside of that kind of sect in the abolition movement and kind of the wider anti-slavery movement. And what's really fascinating is by 1852, Douglas gives a speech, and actually one of his most famous speeches, talking about what does July 4th mean to a slave. He's gone through this entire trans formation process where instead of thinking of the Constitution as a pro-slavery document, he actually thinks it's an anti-slavery document and indeed a glorious document for liberty. Now, now wait a second, because I've heard people talk about this speech and they say, right, they read the part where Douglas is going the 4th of July and it means nothing to the black man who's been a slave. Like they, they really show Douglas saying that America is very negative and, and, and the declaration of the 4th of July is not something that black people should celebrate. That That's what they communicate from this speech. What's fascinating is if you try to find the full speech online, it's extremely, extremely difficult. At least the last time I looked, it, I spent quite a while trying to find the full speech, couldn't find it, eventually just, you know, got off my <laughs> got off my butt and, and went and found a physical copy of now, it. Now, are you suggesting that there might be some kind of big tech censorship? That doesn't happen. No, of course. This is not, not communist China. This is Absolutely. communist America. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, sorry. Uh, all right, PS. Um, but I actually sat down and read through it, and what's fascinating is, is in this speech that people often point at, he actually condemns anybody who would suggest that the founding fathers were, you know, on a whole pro-slavery racist guys. He says it is, quote, a slander upon their memory to say such things. And he goes on and he says, fellow citizens, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinly imposed upon as that of the bro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument, I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing, but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted. The Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway or in it the temple? It is neither. And he keeps on going. And it's just a very powerful mm -hmm. speech where he condemns this idea that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document, that the Founding Fathers were by and large pro-slavery, and says if you read it, if you study it, and you look at the evidence, and you go back to the original sources, you find that the Constitution is a pro-liberty mm -hmm. document and indeed one of the most important ones in the history of the world. And, and what's interesting is this is a change from his first autobiography, yes. right? Which actually, so the second autobiography is 1855, which comes out not too long after this probably he's writing in the midst of this speech in Revelation. But this is where it's interesting when you study someone's life, you can't just take one moment from their life and say, well, here's what they believed or, right, even Frederick Douglass thought America and the Constitution was racist. Well, he actually did at one point in his life. That's just not where he ended his life because you realize there was actually a different part of the story that he had not yet heard because he hadn't done the research. He hadn't gone back to those documents. He hadn't even read the Constitution to speak of. And this is where it's even interesting because he ends up having a third autobiography toward the end of his life. And this one is even more fascinating because it comes at the end of the Civil War. And, and, and he's seen the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendment. He's seen so many civil rights laws pass, which we actually have some of the civil rights laws that passed in 1864. We actually have many more than these, but things that dealt with equality, that dealt with that pay, things that were very significant to many black Americans. And this is something that was happening that Frederick Douglass got to witness after a second autobiography. He's witnessing America take this incredible step towards equality and he's seeing all this unfold. Now, it's also worth noting during the Civil War that Douglass played a pretty big part in helping recruit black Americans to be part of the Mass 54th. There were other, several other black units as well. Uh, in I fact, think actually some of his sons actually volunteered and fought in the war as well. I mean, he really spoke out a lot, encouraging African Americans to go to war, to, to you know, defeat the Confederate States to achieve liberty, not only for themselves, but for everybody who was still enslaved in the South. And I mean, really elevated the, the political kind of position and uh, yeah. uh, authority that African-Americans had in America at that time. So, so we have, again, we, we mentioned we have several links from, from Frederick Douglass. We have a lot of things from the Civil War, including things from the Mass 54th. This is actually a crutch from an individual. It's Private C.H. Goff. Company H, 54th Mass Volunteer Infantry. Uh, it's hard to see, but carved on the side, it says, we fought for the Union and died for liberty. On the other side, it says, long live the 54th Mass Volunteer Infantry and may the Union prevail. Well, this was someone's crutch, and this is just barely over my waist, right? So this, I, I, 
Maybe they use crutches differently. I'm thinking this probably wasn't a really tall person back then. Nonetheless, with all that being said, these are things that Frederick Douglass took a very active part in, in the Civil War, helping to challenge black Americans, black individuals living in America at that time, that you need to help in this cause for liberty, this cause for equality, helping America really live up to the promises of the Declaration, et cetera. That's why when you get to his third autobiography and he's seen all the, the fulfillment of what they were fighting for. He saw the advancement when, when you had then Republican presidents come and take over and under Grant and, and under Garfield, you saw so much advancement of positive legislation being passed. You saw on Reconstruction, so many black Americans in these various states being elected as members of, of Congress or the Senate or actually state legislative bodies, the, the, the birth and explosion of the Republican party with so many black leaders being involved. This is what Frederick Douglass witnessed and, and this is, again, part of the third autobiography. And so he's seen America grow and change, and therefore his view of America grew and changed as well. It's absolutely right, Tim. And in fact, during this whole period, Frederick Douglass is kind of the recipient of a very unique uh, distinction because he is the what's believed to be the most photographed person during that time period. Now, just to put this in context, right, you also have Abraham Lincoln <laughs> during that period as well, but Frederick Douglass uh, is actually kind of, I guess, more popular in front of the cameras than Lincoln is. Or arguably any president. Yeah, any, at least in the 19th period. century, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what's actually kind of cool, we have some pictures, uh, ironically, of Lincoln from that period. This one was actually used um, by the guy who designed the Lincoln Memorial. And this is the actual negative of this picture right here. So this was, you know, what took the picture of Lincoln and then that picture was developed from this negative. So it's very cool to yeah. see. So even though we don't have the negative of a Frederick Douglass photo, we do have one of Abraham Lincoln, which is pretty cool along the way. And again, this is, this is part of the American history that we have collected. We try to preserve and, and utilize to help tell the story. The reason that even some of this conversation matters, and it really is, Jonathan, as you mentioned, it's worth going back and reading the full speech of Frederick Douglass. It's awesome. One of the things that bothers me so much is so often people will give a quote from a speech, a sentence or two, right, from this entire speech and say, see, here's what they thought. And so often we go and look up the full speech and realize, actually, that speech was the exact opposite of what you are saying it is. So one of the things, anytime we hear somebody making a claim, we always want to do further research, right? Is that true? How do we know? Was that all they said about the subject? Was that line or two taken in context? Asking some basic questions to guide us in research to really pursue what is true. In the midst of trying to find what is true, it's interesting that so much of the narrative and story surrounding Douglas has largely been forgotten today, and especially the deeper context of him being so pro-American, so pro the flag, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, along the way, pro-Constitution, pro-founding fathers. One of the reasons that we don't know that today is when the progressive movement kind of began, late 1800s, early 1900s, one of the heroes of the progressive movement was Woodrow Wilson. And this is, is the printing of a five volume set. This one's actually interesting, uh, which one of the volumes is turned backwards because we were looking at something a minute ago. <laughs> uh, but this actually has Woodrow Wilson's signature in the front of this. Uh, th this is a very unique printing of that five volume set, actually has some extra bonus pictures in it. So this was kind of like a special edition of the printing. But in this, Woodrow Wilson, he had been a professor at that time, actually was a professor at a couple of different universities. Uh, then at, after this, printing this five volume set of American history came out. He really got praised so much. He ends up becoming the president of the university. President of Princeton University. And then that kind of provides some of the stepping stones that he needs to later become governor of New Jersey and eventually president of the United States. But his history book, which is called History of the American People, is honestly just terrible. I, I've sat through, I've read <laughs> a lot of it, uh, most of it, if not all of it, and go through and look at it. And what's fascinating is he basically cuts out any of the black heroes from American history, from the revolution, from the War of 1812, from this period in between kind of leading up to the Civil War, uh, one of the guys who never gets mentioned by name during the narrative, during the kind of whole story that's being told is Frederick Douglass, which again, to go mm -hmm. back as the most photographed person from that period, to not mention Frederick Douglass when you're talking about the Civil War, when you're talking about civil rights, when you're talking about emancipation, is a grievous historical malpractice. Yeah. You can't tell the story of that time period in history without Frederick Douglass being a leading figure because he was during that period. Right. 
And, and this is also worth noting that when you look at, at, at specifically Woodrow Wilson, obviously the slight of Frederick Douglass removed him. Woodrow Wilson was a very noted racist individual. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of people today don't recognize how racist Woodrow Wilson was, but it, some very easy things we can point to. If you look at World War I, one of the things Woodrow Wilson did was he resegregated the military. When you have gone through the Civil War where you had black and white soldiers that were on the same side, well, at the end of the Civil War, there was an integration of black and white units. So when you look at other wars that were fought at the end of the Civil War before World War I, there was integrated units because that's part of the position of many of the North who then winning the war, they get to carry forth with that union position of this notion of equality, the promise of the declaration that all men are created equal. Woodrow Wilson, when World War I breaks out, he says, yeah, you know, we really shouldn't have black and white people together. They're really not equal. There's a lot of very noted racist things that Wilson did. So when you learn more about Wilson, it's not really a surprise that he would remove a noted black hero like a Frederick Douglass. But if you go back historically, there was a lot of noted black heroes that certainly should have been talked about because at the end of the Civil War, when you have the Reconstruction movement happening. You actually had the very first black Americans get elected to Congress. Actually, the majority of them had been prior slaves and they become congressmen, they become senators. They, they actually uh, begin being elected all over Southern states and state legislative bodies. There's a lot of noted, well-known noted heroes, even heroes from the Union side of the Civil War who then go on to serve in politics. And Woodrow Wilson excludes all of them, even a guy like a Booker T. Washington, very well-known noted story. Tuskegee Institute opens and toward the end of the 1800s, well, Woodrow Wilson does his book in 1902, but these noted black heroes make no mention in his history book. And again, the connection for some of this is when you look at the progressive movement as, as they're really unfolding in the late 1800s, early 1900s, one of their objectives is to take over education. And when they begin taking over the educational institution in America, one of the things they do is they use Woodrow Wilson, their hero, as his history book, as the playbook for American history going forward. So one of the reasons that today so few Americans have heard the actual, true, full-length story of some of these incredible American patriots is because go back to the progressive era and Woodrow Wilson's history book that became the foundation for a lot of the progressive educational movement, these heroes were not included, which again, this is not just a black hero moment. These are American heroes that were excluded by a white Democrat racist president and when he was a professor writing these history books because of his racist ideology. And that's one of the really sad things looking back at American history uh, of how few people know some of these incredible American patriots today yeah. because of guys like Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, and so that's why we collected, and that's why this Black History Month really encourage you, you know, pick up one, two, or even all three of Frederick Douglass's autobiographies, read through them, try to find the full speech. Um, we'll probably try to post it on wallbuilders.com, so at least it's available somewhere online. And, and read the actual, honest, original documents, because then at that point, you don't have to rely on guys like Woodrow Wilson. You can actually read Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, his autobiography, Up From Slavery, another one to put on your reading list. Learn the true story, learn the real mm -hmm. history, and then all of a sudden you have a totally radically different view of American yeah. history. For more information, you go to wallbuilders.com. We have lots of articles, some great resources. Uh, there's one called American History and Black and White, Setting the Record Straight. Uh, one called The American Story. A lot of great resources to learn more about the true history of America. Go to wallbuilders.com.